Episode 1, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson, and this is the inaugural episode of The Paradox. I'm here today to discuss maintenance of certification, an incredibly important topic and one that affects every physician in America. Even if you're not a physician, in fact, probably more so if you're not a physician, it's important to understand this issue because this is affecting who your doctor is and whether they're able to practice the way you want them to practice or able to practice at all. In fact, this is an issue that's so important that even many physicians don't fully understand and appreciate. But that's why we're going to have this discussion today. Please share the show with your friends. Subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher. It costs nothing. And if you have any further questions, you can leave a comment on my website at theparadox.com. You can also find the show notes page there as well with links to the various websites we discussed during the show. I hope you enjoy the episode. And again, thank you so much for joining me in what I expect will be a very informative and fun discussion. Enjoy. So today, is uh, since the first episode, we're going to talk about the issue that's been most pressing for me and for a lot of physicians in the state of Michigan and around the country, which is maintenance of certification, or MOC for short. It's a very complicated issue, but it's very important because I think uh, not only do physicians need to understand it, which most of them do, but patients need to understand what the physicians are going through. And certainly if you have someone in your family who is dealing with maintenance certification, uh, it's important to know how you can help them, or at least what you can at least understand what they're going through. So first, uh, it's nice to welcome you. Thanks for coming to my studio, Meg. Nice studio. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it's great that you're here. Uh, so a little background about you. You're a general pediatrician here in Grand Rapids in private practice, and you have a couple kids, and you've been practicing for how long now? Oh, that's a tough question. So I've got three kids, and I graduated in 2000, so... A while, right? Right. Yeah. And so you started your practice in Maine, I think, right? Is mm-hmm. that correct? Just three years in Maine. Uh, and then we moved back to Michigan. And I've been here practicing for 11, 12 years. Right. And so the reason you're here today, aside from being a good friend and being very knowledgeable about the maintenance certification issue, is the fact that you are knowledgeable about the maintenance certification issue because you've you've been dealing with it for quite some time as in an issue of advocacy, I guess we'll say, it, since you and I are both uh, politely could be described as activists. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Others might describe us not using other, other terms. Rabble rousers. <laughs> Rabble rousers. <laughs> there might be worse terms as well, but uh, I know we've been working on maintenance certification for a while. So I think just to talk to, to go through for people who are, might not be aware of maintenance certification, can you briefly describe what the, the certification process, board certification process is and uh, the main players in it, I guess, from the ABMS, for instance. Okay. So to distill it down, board certification is a process that physicians go through after graduating from medical school and residency. And for me, I'm a pediatrician. So I completed my medical school, three years of residency, and then you graduate from residency and then you sit for your boards in pediatrics. So at the time that I took my boards, it was just a test that you take once And there were certain doctors that were grandfathered that didn't have to take a test ever again. But for me, I was supposed to take a test again in 10 years at that point and pay a fee. And uh, this actually isn't required to practice medicine in theory. You can be uh, a a physician in practice without passing your boards is the theory. Um, But most physicians want to do it as kind of a feather in the cap. And so for me, when I graduated, it was actually a pretty big deal. You study for your boards and you pass it. And um, it was pretty exciting. 
And then it has changed. So it is no longer a one-time certification. So about five years into my certification, it changed to I was asked to pay another fee. And they've changed the rules pretty much ever since then. So it's continuing to pay fees, continue to research on your patients, continue to do their educational modules, and continue to take tests. And if you don't do any of these portions of this ever-changing process, you will lose all certification. And that is becoming a really big deal because certification is now being required by insurance companies and hospitals in order to practice medicine. So we're in this very weird scenario where a process that was supposed to be voluntary that's run by a private company um, is no longer voluntary, that physicians are required to keep jumping through these hoops and paying these fees in order to practice medicine. It's just, it's bizarre when I try to talk about it because it doesn't, (laughs) it's hard to understand how this got to be such a big thing, but it is. And so to uh, to describe a little more I'm anesthesia, and so for us, we had an oral component to our boards as well. So the initial certification, and what we're discussing today is two certification processes. There's one that's the initial certification, and there's the one that's the, well, it's called the maintenance certification. So what she described with the residency, you finish the residency, after the residency, however that test is perf- uh, conducted, usually it's a year into practice or sometimes two for anesthesia anyway, we would have a written exam a few weeks after we finished completed residency training, which is four years. And then we would have an oral component, which we'd go sit for either six months or nine months afterwards. And then you had to pass both portions of that exam. I know other uh, specialties like the surgical sub- specialties, they often have to do um, case reviews. And so they, they log their cases like how many gallbladders they did and then once they describe that to the oral examiner, they have they get, then get questioned about what would you do if this happened to the patient or they came back with this infection or whatever it might be? And so the, the thought was with this, with this fairly, I guess, uh, rigorous testing that you have created consultants for life, and that was the initial, uh, the initial plan with the, with the certification. And I think the initial board certification is good, right? It's kind of a test at the end of all your training to say, did you learn what you're supposed to learn? You know, and I think most people think that that's a good process. If you've gone through three years, at least for pediatrics, three years of residency, you should be able to pass your boards at the end. Right. And, and, I, and I think there are fairly few, if any, physicians who would be opposed to the initial certification process. I mean, right. I think most, most physicians pass that, although I would say not all of them. I do know some who are practicing, who finished their residency and completed it, but weren't able to pass the boards. It's a very small portion. And as you said, it's hard now when you're not board certified. So I think it's important, too, to talk about the different board certification um, processes in the sense that if someone says, oh, do you want someone who's board certified or not? I think – and they say, well, absolutely, I want someone board certified. The important question is, well, what matters to you? Are you – are you? Uh, do you want them board certified through the National Board of Physicians and Surgeons or the or the American Board of Medical Specialties? Right, and I think there's not a single patient in the country who would know the difference between those and would, no. and would find would no. would know what that even means, right? right? And so, uh, I guess uh, the the main problem here is that the the ABMS or the American Board of Medical Specialties is is the certification process we're talking about specifically. It's not the NBPAS, which is the National Board of Physicians and Surgeons. And there might be other alternative uh, board certification. I know there are for certain specialties like endocrinology and some others. But um, so anyway, so the problem then, of course, is that you can't practice. And that becomes a real problem because you have put a lot of money. And that's not only just the specific physicians, but it's society. And society has spent a lot of money training these physicians and uh, either through state funding or subsidization through medical training programs, medical schools, et cetera. Certainly the residency program is the – pro- the whole process is is paid for by the federal government. And they invest a lot of money into these physicians at a time when we have a shortage of physicians. So not passing the boards is a really big deal or losing your certification and not being able to practice You've because that's a lot of time and money that's been spent by everybody involved. So for so for patients, what do you think the important thing for them to understand about the process? I mean, aside from me just saying right now that certainly people are at risk for the, the certification. You know, if I'm a patient, I say, well, but I think it's probably good that you do this extra testing. I want to make sure you're well qualified. I want to make sure you're staying up to date and stuff. Why is this process 
why are you opposed to it? I mean, I know it costs money, but you guys make a you know pile of money, so it's not a big deal for you to spend you know a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars every couple of years to, to pass these tests. You know, why is it? Why should I care? I think for patients um, to realize, uh, you know, a, f- a few things. One is physicians we already keep up to date all the time. So. Uh, to keep your license in Michigan, you have to have 50 hours of continuing education um, every year. So you are continuing to stay up to date all the time, generally in practice, but then your state also requires you to have continuing education hours. Um, What this is, is actually one private company that is making us buy their continuing education. So um, I think that's more the concern is that we are we are keeping up to date and we're being forced to purchase a product through one particular company. In addition, um, they've never been able to show that uh, doing MOC makes you a better doctor, especially compared to any other continuing education program we could be doing. So I think for patients to realize that we are continuing to stay up to date, we are not opposed at all to staying up to date. It's just having to purchase this one product or not be able to see patients. That's what we're opposed to. And, and can you briefly describe what understanding that every specialty is different, you know, cardiology is certainly different than um, family practice or pediatrics or some of the other subspecialties. So what's the, what's the process in the 10 year cycle with the, with the ABMS? And I guess the important key here is with the American board of medical specialties, that they are actually the umbrella organization that all the other major, I guess you'd say, uh, board specialties are under. For instance, mine would be the American board of anesthesiology. Yours is the American board of pediatrics. There's American board of urology and all the other sorts of ones. And so they all have general rules that ABMS requires them to fulfill to, to qualify as an ABMS, I guess, sponsored specialty or whatever. Uh, What exactly is the the process, if you describe briefly, for every specialty? Okay. So there are 24 subspecialties. So everyone has kind of their own tweaks on it. Um, For grandfather doctors, they just take their test once. And And these are not just old doctors, right? So you probably should describe what a... Grandfather doctor. (laughs) Not just once. They're only maybe eight years, 10 years older than me. So they're not really that much older than I But they could be grandfathers, actually. If you look at it, I mean, we're getting kind of up there. So they certainly could be grandfathers. Okay, sorry. So they they just take their test once and never do anything else. They just have to keep a state license that's active and they have to do their, you know, continuing education through their state, but they don't have to do anything else. Those of us who are not grandfathered, um, there are multiple components of that. Um, paying a fee is one. Um, and what would that fee in general be over the span? Because um, it's about a 10-year cycle. Most of these are 10, planned, right? When they, The fee is just part of the cost of this. And they look at the cost uh, away from the office, away from your patients, um, traveling to board review courses. It's anywhere from 25000 to 45000 every 10 years. It's going to cost you to do MOC. So it's not a, a, a small cost. Um, you also have to do uh, some sort of a test, whether it's a every 10 year test, whether right now the American Board of Pediatrics has moved to monthly testing. Um, they also make you do some sort of a research project on your patients, which, um, is <laughs> a little unusual. <laughs> so you do a research project on your patients. Most patients don't know this is happening and then it's sent to the boards, um, and they have that information. And then there's usually some sort of an educational module that they do uh, online. It's their proprietary educational module. So, and, it, and it's confusing. I mean, it's changing all the time. Like I, when I first started out, it was a 10-year test. Three, four years into it, I had to pay another fee, and it, suddenly it changed drastically. And even in the past year, it's changed again to not just an every 10-year test. It's a monthly test. So I, I can't even keep up with it. And I think it's it's important to note that it, there is a lot of resistance within the, the medical f- fields, with, and in pretty much every specialty, as far as I can tell, there's a significant amount of physicians who are upset about pretty much the – I mean, the cost and the time is what really most people have the biggest problem with. I think when it comes to testing, I mean, we're used to taking tests, and even we're doing our CMEs, uh, continued medical education. There's usually some test component that you have to prove that you learned something during whatever you were doing, whether it was a lecture or – you're reading some that journal article or whatever it might be. And so I guess the testing is, does not bother people as much as traveling to the test, taking a day off work for the test maybe. And so they've been tweaking these things in some way because they're getting so much resistance from physicians 
that, well, we'll just make it online or we'll make it open book or we'll do other things, which, again, you know, makes you wonder the utility of, I mean, how useful this sort of thing is after. If you're starting to remove all right. of the portions of it and it's a take home test and, you know, is it, you start wondering, is this just more of a money grab? Right. I, I mean, I think, and, and now physicians are looking at it as, I think, is pretty much just being fleeced and, and it's. It's right. a, a money grab. And if you don't keep doing it, they take away your certification. I mean, and you just, you have to comply or you can't right. be a doctor anymore. Exactly. I mean, they have the power to, they can't take away your license, but they can take away your ability to practice or at least get paid by people unless you're outside, somehow outside the system. And for the most part, most physicians are within the third party system, which is means you, someone has some insurance carrier, whether that's a government payer or that's a private payer, there's some sort of payment involved that's that is not controlled by the patient i guess is right. you can't it's not a normal transaction where you like walk into a store and buy a loaf of bread it's a totally different sort of business that's an entirely different podcast right. <laughs> and discussion to have about how the system like should look five five podcasts that might be <laughs> and that's generous so i think it might <laughs> you might barely be able to, to touch on it for in five broadcasts uh so i think it's also important to note that you know if you're in uh, most specialties uh, that people think about, like cardiology, let's say nephrology, hematology, oncology, you know, cancer doctors, they're actually initially board certified under internal medicine. And so they actually are double board certified in, in the sense that they're certified within their subspecialty. So I am a cardiologist, and so I'm going to get my certification in cardiology. But I also – I had got my internal medicine first. And so what they do is they finish their internal medicine training for three years and then they go on to a fellowship in one of those specialties. And that's not unusual for them to be triple board certified. If right. they're med peds and they're a subspecialist, you've got three boards that you're trying to keep right. on top of. And I have a friend who in town here who, and she's – so she did her medicine and then she did hemonc. Well, hemonc is actually two boards. And so she has the hematology boards, the oncology boards, and the medicine boards. Now, she certainly could drop the medicine boards and not ever be – board certified, but she spent a lot of, you know, she spent three years of her life trained to be an internist, learned all that stuff. And so she should be an internist. She shouldn't lose her certification saying she's no longer, you know, able to do internal medicine. I mean, she's, I mean, she's kind of doing that. She's not doing every part of internal medicine, but I think, you know, one of the, one of the issues that a lot of physicians have with the process is we're, we're forced to train in things and, and recertify on things we don't practice, right? I mean, it, you know, if I have CMEs and I have 50 hours I have to complete for the state of Michigan, which is a lot compared to most states, uh, I focus my 50 hours on stuff I'm going to do. I'm not going to spend 50 hours personally. I don't do cardiothoracic anesthesia so I don't, or chronic pain. So I don't spend any of my 50 hours on that stuff because it is not relevant to my practice. It doesn't help my patients for me to know stuff that I won't ever, you know, do. And they're I mean, every specialty is like that. I mean, sure, pediatrics the same thing, right? You don't need yeah. to know. I think that's probably one of the big sticking points for physicians is that this process is not valuable. So as opposed to being able to choose a CME that benefits your patients and your patient population, you have to do the CME that these companies are telling you to do. And so um, it's detrimental, actually detrimental to your education. You know, instead of being able to pick and you know, I, I need to learn more about pediatrics and psychiatry. I can't do that. I have to do all of pediatrics in some areas that I may not be very um, interested in or my patients aren't in that population anymore. And I think, you know, for other physicians, for surgeons in particular, if they specialize and suddenly they're having to go back and spend a lot of time um, learning about areas they aren't even practicing anymore, it's a waste of time. It's terrible, terrible waste of time. Well, we have plenty of time. I mean, there's no... There's, I mean, physicians have all kinds of time. All kinds of time. Because we don't have families. We don't have, um, we don't have interests outside of medicine. We don't have any vacations we take. We don't have other, you know, other stuff we're doing. No. Pretty much, I focus. I mean, I get home at night. I usually, you know, read a journal for four hours. I go through my CMEs. I sleep about four hours. I get up early to go over my new questions for my board. I think that's what they think. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think you know, it's easy. It's easy to look at any sort of profession, you know, from afar. It's sort of you walk into the office, and you, I mean, you naturally assume these people know what they're doing, right? I mean, I think, and I think yeah, you. So you and you assume they have. That's kind of all they do. It's sort of like when you were a kid, and you saw your teacher at the grocery store, and you're like, what? "They're a person. They don't." I thought they lived at the school, right? Right. I mean, I think it's a lot like that. Yeah. 
Well, I think that's part of the burnout problem is that I don't think the people that are doing this realize all the other, they don't realize all the other pressures that, and things that we do in our lives. And so I think that this, when you talk about physician burnout, um, MOC is one of those issues. It's kind of the tipping point for many physicians. You've, you've trained for so long, you, you're in a practice, you're finally getting your groove. And then this MOC comes upon you and it, it throws you for a loop. You're suddenly, you know, it, it, worst case scenario, you don't pass your boards. It can be an incredibly devastating thing for physicians. Um, you know, and well, that means they're incompetent. So it's probably best well, that is they what they failed, feel right? like, right? And um, what what they've shown is actually these these um, board tests. They have slowly increased the fail rate because if you fail it, you have to pay for it again. Um, it's a great way to make money. The physicians who are failing this don't realize the game is a little bit rigged. And so you are a smart doctor, you you know your stuff, you go and take your test and you fail. And you don't tell anyone. Physicians don't tell anyone when they fail. They don't tell their family. Um, it's, a, it's a horrible experience. They think they're the only ones. It's not until they start talking to other doctors, they realize that other physicians have failed this as well too. And so it, it's one of those extra pressures um, that just adds to the burnout. And I, and I, I don't, I feel horrible for these physicians that go through this. Um, well, and I think stories, you can't believe the stories. <laughs> oh yeah. And I think, you know, when it comes to talking about failure, I, not only that, but I think oftentimes we're not allowed to from a legal sense, right? Because some of our failures might be, uh, I've well, come with some blessings that I've not gone through this, but where you have, where you get a malpractice suit, so you oftentimes cannot talk about these, these issues because, most people don't realize, but when you apply for credentialing for a hospital or surgical center or wherever, one of the questions on these credentialing forms is, well, so you'll have a couple of peers or colleagues who will fill out a form for you say, to verify that you are who you say you are. So for instance, I, for instance, I want to apply to this hospital X, and so I uh, submit credentialing. They say, well, we need a couple of peer reviews from your peers, wherever you are, whether you're a resident or whether you're a staff somewhere else, maybe you're relocating to a city or something. And one of the a number of questions, not just one, but a number of them are, do you know this person? Do you know if they ever had any substance abuse issues? Do you know if they had any problems with personal interaction and conflict? Do you know if they ever been named in a lawsuit? And that is one of the questions. And so you, it doesn't matter who you are. You can't, it, the more you talk about these sorts of things, the, the greater risk you have, and then the greater risk you have. And maybe it was, maybe you were at fault or maybe you weren't. And so in general, failure is not something that we're allowed to talk about or encouraged to. And this is one of those, it, it's too bad that people don't. I mean, I, especially um, the problem with a lot of these tests are they are so incredibly out of date that it's it's not hard to fail some of these tests. So for example, when I took my pediatric boards, the part that I failed on my boards actually did the worst was allergy and immunology, which is pretty funny because that's probably the one area of pediatrics I know the best. So I am the most up to date on that. I have three children with food allergy. I've treated anaphylaxis in my house many times with my own children. If there's one area in pediatrics I'm up to date on, it's allergy and immunology. But that's the part that I did the worst on my boards. And these tests are incredibly out of date. We will have physicians who they are the chair of their department and they are failing their board exams um, because they really have more up-to-date information than the boards are, te- are, are testing them on. And they will actually, they're actually board review courses that will teach doctors to give the wrong answers medically so that they will get the right answer for the test. And physicians who are taking this test and failing don't realize that that's what's going on. And it's a shame that they're not talking because it's not their fault they're failing these tests. Right. I mean, so there are two things back we talked about before that I think are very interesting. I mean, one is the, um, I guess we talk about the the testing process for, I shouldn't say testing, research portion of these tests, these certification process. So we have this in anesthesia as well. And so these are always deemed as quality initiatives. And so, for instance, if I'm starting practice, You'll find in if any of you medical students listening there, you'll find that when you get out into practice and or when you're residency, you learn that it turns out there are about a hundred ways to treat the same thing usually effectively. I mean, sometimes it's there's one certain thing you can do. Anaphylaxis, you give them epinephrine or something, right? But for the most part, there are lots of different ways to get to where you want to end up, and it just kind of depends on your style and sort of how you feel comfortable and 
and you get used to using certain medications to treat certain conditions, and then you just get very facile, very you know, um, very good at it. And so that's just kind of how you practice in whatever the field might be, how you perform a surgery, what kind of surgery you use, all that kind of stuff. It's just you have your own style. And so that's why some things aren't repeatable. It's I guess what you'd say is it's the um, the art of medicine or it's the sort of – it's not just – we're not just operating in books, right? I mean that's it, – it's in some ways we're not scientists. But so we have these quality assurance things. And so if you change your practice, like I'm going to start tr- – testing for diabetes in all patients or something, everyone who's age over the age of five, let's say in my practice, where I would before is over 10. Or, and so, or there might be things like that that are quality, they'll, they'll call quality initiatives. And so those are technically not studies. So if I have you come into my office and say, hey, I want to draw some blood, and then you would have the right to ask, well, why? Or I'd rather not, or because I would have to have some reason for doing it, right? Especially if it's for research, research purposes. Mm-hmm. But they're actually having us with this board, which is not really talked about too often with these this MOC process, but they're actually having us perform research studies, right? I mean, basically, right. it's, it's sort of quality assurance, but it will only be quality assurance if it's just your practice. Right. So a portion of this are these quality, the quality assurance, quality improvement modules where you're supposed to make a change to your practice of medicine and show a certain outcome. So um, hospitals, you know, do these sort of things – you know, all I mean, little ones all the time, you know, they're going to mm-hmm. change the way that they, you know, have you check in or they change, you know, the way that they, what they're ever encouraging at that time, checking BMIs on all patients. So these are little quality projects they're doing all the time. Um, they're now requiring, and we do them, we're always doing these sort of things in our practice, um, but they're actually requiring these for your board certification, which is kind of an interesting topic. So, one of the things about this is some of them can be pretty invasive. And like you were saying, you're asking a patient to get in, you know, to, to give blood or you're changing the amount of times they're coming back for their asthma management and not telling them why, not saying this is part of a research project, this is for my MOC. And so these patients are, are getting enrolled in these projects, perhaps coming back for extra visits they wouldn't have otherwise been required to come back for with no understanding that they're part of this project. So I, I think that's a huge, huge problem of informing the patient what they're what they're going through. The secondary and probably more insidious concern about these part four it's a, it's called a part four MOC. Part one part. is just sending the check, right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> part one is sending the check in MOC. Yeah. That's the easy one. Yeah, the easy Give one. us money. Yeah, the part, part four, four is, is the quality is, is the quality assurance one. So um, the thing that's most insidious about this one is what happens is um, they have you do these quality improvements and then they show that you improved your quality. And what's really actually being researched is not what you have done as a physician to improve your patient's health outcomes. What's actually being researched is the physician. What's being researched is the MOC. Because when this gets published and touted by these boards, they don't say, oh, that doctor did this, uh, did something different in their practice and patients got better. They say the doctor did MOC and the patient got better. And so it's actually the not only are the patients being enrolled in a project without their, you know, informed consent, the physician is being forced to do this project that in the end is supposedly selling MOC. It's a mess. Right. So they're being enforced, they're forced enrollment in order to push the product further and convince people of its utility. It's crazy. Because I've talked to people who've done, in, again, anesthesia, where there's, there's simulators where you work on simulated patients, and at the end, you have to give a evaluation. It's not clear if you need to have a good evaluation to say, because the questions are, will this change your practice? Do you feel you'd be, be do a better job taking care of this condition or whatever? I mean, I think that there, it'd, be a, it'd be the uh, courageous person who would say, this will not affect my practice. I don't think this was very helpful. And I'm I'm upset that I had to come here and spend right, right. fifteen hundred dollars. You don't want to do that until you actually have, have passed. Right. right. It's like it's the old joke, right? You don't criticize the barber why they still have the scissors in their hand, right? right. You wait until you get right. home and say, right. "Yeah, that was a bad haircut. I'm not going back there again." Right. The, the pediatric one that cracked me up was I did a hand washing module, and I'm a pediatrician. I wash my hands 
all the time. Do you uh, do you submit to the germ theory then? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Kids are germy. So I wash my hands all the time. And so the way this module worked is you're supposed to rate your hand, do your hand washing and have your patient rate your hand washing. Then you go through this module to show you how to wash your hands. And then you then have a patient rate your hand washing. And you're supposed to show that you, before and after, that after you are washing your hands better and more often. I went through it and I didn't show a change because I always wash my hands to begin with and I always wash my hands after the module and they made me do it over. They said I didn't show any improvement. <laughs> and so so then I went through and I had to lie about how the first time I didn't wash my hands as often, then I did the module and then I showed improvement. But what I realized in the end is I just showed to them that their MOC project improved my hand washing when it really didn't. But that's the only way I could actually get it to accept my data. <laughs> I'm actually curious how you got toddlers to fill out a survey on your hand washing. I, I don't know. Did you give them crayons or something? Yeah, like stickers. a sticker? <laughs> stickers, pretty much. Yes, yeah, because you're always the one claiming that pretty much you just are a doctor who hands out stickers. Yes, that's all I do. Yeah. My wife also is a pediatrician for full disclosure. And yeah, she talks about poop a lot. <sighs> and actually the, the term poop and not, you know, the medical term for feces or whatever. So, <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, one of the other things... That's important. So why does this matter to, I guess, the question, why does it matter to uh, the average person who's out there in the streets? I mean, I think we all have an, we all have some interest as, as society to have people who are trained to take care of our illnesses when we get sick. Some, I mean, oftentimes we'll talk about the ones who come in who aren't sick. Certainly in the primary care office, you'll see a lot of that, like, you've got a cold, go home, right? But there are times when you pick up things that you know are very important and losing people – for reasons that are not because they're bad is probably a serious problem in this country. It, it, certainly when you look at how much it costs to train someone, not only in time, and but also expense. You look at the average medical school, I believe it's about a quarter million dollars at least in expense, student expense. And I'm sure there's a subsidy from the federal government and the state governments on top of that as well. And that's just to get a med- through someone through medical school. That doesn't include residency. I mean, residency is, again, about... I think it's about $250,000 a year in expense per resident per year. So it's not, it's not a, it's an expensive right. venture, right, to train these people. And so just discarding them for, for not washing their hands enough or because they're already doing the right thing doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. I mean, I know you have some stories of people who got sick and they had, and they weren't able to finish this. I mean, right. what do you have? How would you Patients should care about this because it's an access issue. So it's one of – it's a huge driver in early retirement for physicians. So if they're sitting – I mean, this is what you know older physicians are talking about. Oh, I have to research in you know five years. I'm planning on retiring before, which is so ridiculous that you would lose a physician because – you know, over this process, which is supposed to be voluntary. It's a private certifying company. They shouldn't have any influence over our ability to be physicians. Um, but that's what's happening. Um, or physicians who it's just too, you know, the process is too stressful, it's too onerous, and they decide that they're going to stop practicing. Or if a physician just decides not to participate anymore, they're like, I've passed my boards three, four times, I'm done with this. And then as a result, they lose their certification. Insurance companies don't credential them. Suddenly patients are getting that letter in the mail that says your doctor no longer participates with Blue Cross Blue Shield. And we are going to be assigned to someone new and you lose your doctor over something like this. That, that's why patients should care. Right. I mean, I think, and I think just the, the fact that the, the process is very, I don't want to say inhumane, but it certainly is not very personal. I mean, there's not... When you do the boards initially with your initial round, I mean, there is definitely a test and there's an oral exam, but it's a personal, I mean, there's a, without a doubt, it, it focuses on your ability to perform whatever it is, whatever your specialty is. I mean, I think, you know, what your knowledge base is. I feel like there's a very impersonal process where it's sort of, it's very bureaucratic in the sense that you don't, they're not really assessing you as much as your ability to fill out the boxes and to, to fill out the correct forms and to kind of just go through the motions. Right. I, you know, I, at least when I took it the first time, all of my fellow residents, we were all studying at the same time. We were all going down to the same place and we all took our boards. I mean, it was very much, you felt like you were, you know, part of something big, something important. Um, this, <laughs> it, it's everyone's on different cycles. So you really feel like you're alone in this process. You just show up at a testing center alone. You're doing these little 
research projects alone. It, it, you know, and if anything, it's really you're not treated as a person. So we there are so many examples of physicians who are you know in the middle of serious hardships, physicians with cancer who are immunocompromised who call up the board and say, look, I'm on, I'm on chemo right now. I'm, can I postpone this? And the answer is always no, they don't allow any leeway. Um, just some really heartbreaking stories of, you know, parents, you know, they're in the hospital with their kid who has, you know, cancer and they just don't have the time to be studying for these boards and asking for an extension and they're denied it. And so these parents are having to choose, you know, I, should I stay with my kid or am I going to lose my job? I mean, and that's, ridiculous that it's come to that point. So you're saying physicians have families and yes. they actually have yes, obligations outside of their career? Yeah, we do. Interesting. <laughs> That's somewhat surprising. I think people yes. think that, you know, that doesn't really happen. Um, yeah. yeah, I, the fact that people would lose their career over something happening is really, is very bothersome. And, you know, it's, does it happen to everyone? Probably not that often, but it certainly happens at a decent clip that, you know, everyone knows someone who's in a car accident or some sort of calamity or some sort of medical problem that will put them in a situation where they might not be able to perform whatever it is as far as the testing process goes or collecting the data. And, you know, and then if you look at other practices, if you're a small, let's say you're a solo practitioner, which there aren't a whole lot of anymore, but let's say you're a solo practitioner out somewhere and you're trying to perform quality data uh, modules, that's very difficult. You probably don't have anyone in the office who could be of any help to you. You might have a nurse in your office. You might just have some MAs or nurse assistants who don't have really significant medical background training who could help you in performing any sort of study. So you're kind of doing this on the side, you know, all by yourself and and to try and get those submitted and have them approved by – I know they try and make it a little bit easier sometimes, but even that is – well, not to mention, you know, a private practice doctor is going to have to close down the office to go do their board review. Mm-hmm. They're going to have to close down the office to go and take their boards. I mean, it's a it's a big deal for especially for private doctors. I I don't know how people in really rural areas do this because you have to travel a good distance to go and take your boards and go to your board review courses. So it's it's a big problem. Yeah. I don't think I don't think they're going to change either. I mean, these boards are making a lot of money off of this. I mean. A lot of money. Well, that's kind of funny because I thought they were nonprofit organizations. And so if it's nonprofit, it shouldn't be making money. No, they're making a lot of money. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I think the, the this is the problem with the podcast. Yeah. You can't see the sarcasm. Hopefully it comes yeah. through. The, the former president of the American Board of Pediatrics. Now, pediatricians were the bottom of the barrel when it comes to um, – payment for um, physicians. Now, the president of the American Board of Pediatrics, um, the previous president, earned $1.3 million a year for um, his work. And then they decided to keep him on a little bit longer. And now he's a consultant and he's earning about $800,000 a year for oh, anywhere about 10 hours a week. So there's a lot of money to be made on making physicians go through this process. So because there's so much money, I don't I don't know why they would change what they're doing. It seems right. to be working for them. And I think once you start looking at the process, it, I think, you know, when this first, when there's initial certification, these boards were fairly small. I mean, I think... They didn't have a lot of employees. There wasn't a whole lot to it. They had they would have people contribute test questions who were usually in academia, wherever they might be. So you'd contact the pediatric gastroenterologist. You have a couple of very major universities around the country, and they'd submit their questions for the questions on you know kids not pooping well. And then you have the ones for the allergists, and they'd submit their questions. And so that's how you'd sort of piece together a test. Uh, right. And then for the oral boards, it, same thing. You have some of those guys coming to ho- a hotel. And I guarantee they were not going to hotel in Syracuse, New York. They're going to – these hotels are in San Diego. They're in Orlando because you've got to convince these guys to go and talk to a bunch of uh, kids just finishing their residency. So they're always in nice places. So they get a nice little vacation, especially when you're in academics where generally the pay is not as well. So it's a good excuse, I guess, to get out, to, to leave. Um, so – it wasn't. It wasn't a huge expense. It, it just wasn't a big endeavor. There wasn't a lot of money to be made in this. And and as you know, hopefully, just because you're considered nonprofit does not mean that you don't make money and have to have expenses be smaller than revenue, right? I mean, you can. What you end up doing is you just end up spending that money, and you either save it for a rainy day with these organizations, or you give it to your the people, your employees, whether that's the people at the top. 
it just puts in perspective when Meg's talked about someone making one point two million dollars a pediatrician. That is not a typical salary for a pediatrician. No, that's about the t- no. that's about ten pediatricians, <laughs> maybe not ten, maybe like eight. But it really is. I mean, it's mm-hmm. the average pediatrician's making. I mean, in full practice, when you're if you're really hustling, maybe you're making one forty, one fifty, maybe, maybe. I mean, it just kind of depends where you are. Some people make more. It just depends on how you run your practice. So you know, one point two million dollars, and I, I guarantee you. That job is not that hard. Uh, no, that person does not get <laughs> spit up on. They're guaranteed. They're, <laughs> they're not dodging Their clothes the clothes p- are as clean at the end of the day <laughs> as they are at the beginning of the day, unless they spill some caviar on their tie Maybe. or something like that, right? Yeah. Uh, and so I think you know when you, you can. So what you see here is that this process is now we've taken a process that was a one-time fee, right? Finishing your residency, where again they could charge any amount they wanted for that initial test, and they you know it's a, couple, it's a number. Of, at least when I took mine, it was a couple thousand dollars, I think, to take mm-hmm. the test. And I think the oral is a couple thousand as well. But you're taking that one time. Now they know they're going to get you every 10 years. Or every five. Or every five. <laughs> or every year. No, now. Now every year. Right now, you know, we're, we don't want to charge you 2000 or $2,500 every 10 years. We're just going to charge you 250 a year. So it's a lot easier to take, right? It's like a mortgage. Except also, oh, by the way, you need to take this, uh, this our CMEs that we've Perform for or that we write ourselves on whatever it might be, hand washing, and that's going to cut. You have to pay for that. It's fifty dollars. It's just fifty bucks. Oh, but there's another two, another credit you have to do every year, right? And so, and now you're buying the now you're buying the products from them. You're and you're paying annually, or which I'm sure for their standpoint is better because they have a steady revenue stream as opposed to you know getting lump sums from everybody who just suddenly says, "Screw you guys, I'm done at nine years. I'm not going to pay anymore." So they can verify, they can you know keep the money coming. So if you decide to not finish the ten year cycle, it doesn't matter to them because you've already paid eight years worth, right. right? Whereas now, I'm sure every year if you don't keep paying, they'll just take you off their website again. Right, you suddenly disappear from the face of the earth. You're just like yep. wiped out. Yep, as if you never passed ever to begin with. Even <laughs> it's, yeah. it's insidious. And, and I think if you when you um if you were to look at uh, salary, so the when it comes to salaries for organizations and for various positions, if you were to, there are a number of companies in this country, consulting companies or whatever that might go by, uh, and then they will list how much an average salary should be for based on what your duties are and the size of the organization. So, for instance, if you're looking for an executive director to, to run an organization, and my private practice group went through this, and so we could find out how much an average um, executive director would make. Uh, based on an organization that has a certain amount of revenue. So if you're a you know, $50 million organization, if you're a $100 million organization, if your revenue is a you know, billion dollars, your compensation changes based on your position. Whether you're mm-hmm. C- So if you're the CEO of, a, of you know, a 1711 or something, your salaries can be very small. Because, but if you're the CEO of 1,000 711s, your compensation should be more. And so what has happened kind of in a strange way is that because there are far more – general um, practitioners, people who are in primary care, they have – they they charge the same pretty much as the larger specialties as far as the – throughout the cycle. I think their time away from work is technically worth less. So they maybe their full costs are a little bit less because, you know, a day out of the office for a pediatrician is a lot different than a day out of the office for an electrophysiologist who's, you know, making I don't know how many thousands of dollars they make in a day. But essentially their, their revenue is – far greater. And there are far more of them, right? So the mm-hmm. pediatricians have way more. And so if you look at the salaries, it's very strange because the pediatricians are making $1.2 million and you have the the head of, I don't know, whatever the board of anesthesia is maybe making 600000 or 700000 Although from a specialty standpoint, you'd see a, a reversal as far as you know salaries from the, from the individual practitioners. Yet because they have so many more people involved and so much more revenue, they get tr- they get paid and compensated more, although their job's the same. Part of it too, um, the two boards that started doing MOC first were family medicine and pediatrics. So they were the first ones to kind of force the MOC issue. And if you look at the revenue, how much money these boards are making, the board of pediatrics and the American Board of Family Medicine are at the top, and that's not because they have the most um, people that they certify. American Board of Internal Medicine is the one that's the largest. They certify, I think, one out of every four mm-hmm. physicians in the country. It's the reason why 
family medicine and pediatrics earn more than American Board of Internal Medicine is because they started MOC first. They doubled their money. <laughs> the you know, <laughs> so that all these other boards are looking at what happened with the pediatricians. They're like, oh my gosh, by doing MOC, we you can double your money because you're making physicians keep paying until they retire. And so it's a <laughs> that's part of it, right? So the pediatricians are just smarter as when it comes to making money on the backs of their former pe- their fellow pediatricians. We're nice people, so I think they knew they could get away <laughs> with it. We'll just say, oh, "Okay, well, we're nice. We'll we'll do it." Um, contrast that with the competing board, National Board of Physicians and Surgeons, and there, no one in that organization, none of the physicians on the board, and none of the advisory members make a salary at all. It's a hundred percent voluntary. So uh, that's, I mean. Perhaps the way we need to go <laughs> a little bit on that. And that's almost more nonprofit, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, when you look at – because I think when people think nonprofit, they think, oh, it's sort of an really altruistic sort of endeavor where people are just you know, doing, doing things out of the goodness of their heart and they're, just, and they're just trying to help out or they're trying to promote their specialty. And that's what I truly think National Board of Physicians and Surgeons is doing is they are providing a service. They're saying this is another way to – maintain your certification. You know, you don't have to go through ABMS. You can use another alternative. And they really actually are focused on the education of physicians. And so at this time, I do think it is, you know, because they care about our profession and care about our education. Right. And so, you know, if you wanted to find more, more information, the link, link to that will be obviously on the show notes page at nbps.org, I believe it is. Yep. And, um, and, you know, that's, and that was sort of my joke at the beginning, right? Like, where do you care about your certification coming from? Well, no one knows any – all they know is that, well, yeah, they have to be board certified. But it does, it's it's sort of like I want the best person, but I don't really know what that means. And so people are right, right to ask for the highly trained person, mm-hmm. but they also have a right to know what that really means and whether MOC process versus the non-MOC process actually changes the fact that when someone's highly trained is I think kind of the crux of the whole thing here today. I think – I think in some ways you could almost argue that people are worse trained with MOC because they're no longer – assuming someone's going to spend the same amount of time on education or materials as they would without, with or without an MOC, which I think we assume probably people would, uh, they're going to at least focus on stuff they're going to be using in real life versus stuff that they might not be using in real life and plus all the extra time away from – and the frustrations and whatnot. I mean mm-hmm. I think overall it's a much better situation. There's a lot going on sort of with the internal medicine board. We won't go into that, but I think that'll be another episode at some other point. I got to find an internist. Yeah. Why? <laughs> because the, and the reason internal medicine is so big is, of course, all those other subspecialty fellowships are the initial branches with through internal medicine. So that's why they're so large. So I guess I'd like to thank you for coming on. Hopefully people learn some things and there are a lot of things you're up to. I know. <laughs> I am. <laughs> which why it's been so hard to get you here. Uh, so I appreciate you coming, but I know like you do, you blog not only about medicine stuff at rebelmd.org.com, right? Yep. And you talk about, well, obviously this is not mainstream stuff, right? That at rebelmd. Right. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you're not a bomb thrower, but no. I mean, I think it's safe to say <laughs> that, that you're willing to question sort of the way things work. Right. right? I mean, I think that's, that's sort of the, because I think, you know, physicians, we're just busy doing our own thing. And it's a lot easier to just say, well, whatever, I can't do anything about it or I don't have – I don't know how to do it. And physicians are really bad in that way. I think we're just not very – we're not fighters when it comes to bureaucracy and, and, and especially things we think are, might be good for us, right? Right. I mean lawyers would never put up with continued education and taking the bars every 10 years. I guarantee that never happens. Or, yeah. or accountants. I mean I don't think anybody – Outside of medicine, outside of healthcare, I mean, I know other mid-level providers also do certification and cycles as well, but I don't think anybody, any other sort of that I'm aware of. I mean, there, maybe there are, but I, I don't see, I don't, don't see other stuff. specialties that or any sort of career that would do that. It's very smart on the part of the boards. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they've picked maybe the only people who feel guilty enough that they, well, I ought to be smart enough. I ought to be able to pass these tests, and so, right. and I'm just. Not willing to fight, I guess. But you have other interests too. You mentioned the kids with allergies. You've got, I think, three. Oh, yeah, three kids with allergies, and yeah. so a lot of um, a lot of trouble with Michigan in general with the pollen and stuff, and then yeah. also foods. <laughs> and so, and so you have a really great cooking site too. I think people should see. 
she does not always focusing on continued medical education. She actually cooks and bakes and stuff. Pretty amazing, I'll have to say. But at, and that's all can be found at your other website, which is totally unrelated to medicine at Speed Bump Kitchen. Speed Bump Kitchen, yeah. And how often do you post there? Oh, it's been a year. I think we looked. It's been a year. But the site's been going on for almost 10 years now. So, yeah. I enjoy- it's a fun outlet <laughs> when yeah. I can get to it, right? Well, I was going through there and I was like, wow, I... I need to come to your house or something because there's some good stuff there. It's that good stuff. The uh, Mickey Mouse ice cream cookies, I saw that. That looked pretty good. But it's a lot of work. I mean, it is a lot it's of not work. easy having kids yeah. with allergies. I <laughs> I try to do just limit my diet for one month and it's really, it's a struggle. I'm really glad I wrote those recipes down though because my kids are now using my website to cook for themselves. Which is kind of funny because they'll be working on it. They're like, oh my gosh, this is so much work. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Tell me about it. <laughs> Welcome to life, it's guys. Only, you're just making it. I actually had to make the recipe up and take a picture of it and post it. So so any other places you're writing besides those two? I think that's it, right? I don't, yeah, I don't know. I thought you had a new website, but I can't recall. Oh, I probably do. <laughs> <laughs> Every few months I've built a new website, so... Which is, by the way, incredibly difficult stuff. I've learned how to just doing it for this podcast. It's, uh, but it's amazing what you can do now. You can learn just by watching YouTube and know. Uh, you know all kinds of other different sites. I and for relatively cheap money, it's a great way to get the message out. So I would encourage everyone to, if you're a physician, make sure you send this link and to your other fellow physicians. Sign up for the podcast through iTunes or Stitcher, or however you uh, stumbled across this. Uh, and really recommend it to your friends. And I think it's important, this sort of issue, especially for your for your family and friends and anyone really who is involved in, who has, touches medicine, which is really pretty much everybody, right? I mean, everybody at some level gets sick. Uh, I've been fortunate, but my, I've certainly had sick kids and my wife at times. And so anyway, I mean, they patients need to know understand this too and what really, you know, what's what we're dealing with. And I think it's important for them to know that. And so it's important for them to go and, to share this and listen to this podcast too. I think we're going to have a lot of interesting issues, not only on maintenance certification, which is certainly one that is one that I'm passionate about, but there are all kinds of other things, whether it's medical education or how uh, bureaucracy is sort of taking over the medicine, how we actually structure our healthcare system in, in the country, and all sorts of other things that I might come up with at my time. And I'm going to lean on Meg as well to send me issues and topics because I can because, come up with a lot because for you. A she's list. really. You know, she writes for a Rebel MD, so she's got she's got some things. So I also appreciate if you went to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com and go to uh the the Paradox show and just search for it and sign up and send me a couple dollars because the other part about this that I did not talk about, of course, is that my my wife thinks this is kind of a, a, a Looney Tunes venture is to, to launch a, a podcast, as well as some of my friends. Some might be uh, located close to me too here right now. <laughs> a little loony too. It's all right though. It's good. I mean, it's okay to have like kind of crazy ventures, but uh, it helped to just, you know, I don't need much money, but it'd be nice to break even. So if if you're a physician out there and you think this is an important voice and it's important things to talk about, I love to have some support uh, and you can support through Patreon. It's a good way to help cover the expenses, which are really surprisingly, I mean, considering what it would take to get this sort of message out say 25 years ago, it would have, I mean, I can't imagine how impossible it would be for just an average person uh, to get this message out to, you know, potentially millions of people. And now you can do it for not much. I mean, as long as you've got a computer and I bought a couple microphones and away you go with the, with the technology that's all actually even free. And I learned how to use GarageBand, so now I can make a song. It's only in a loop though, so my, my musical talent's not that great, but <laughs> not like my kids, they're much better. But thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you later. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what The Doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash The Paradox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com. You don't have like questions? Like you didn't write anything down? Oh, I don't think so. I'm just, we'll see how this goes. Oh okay.
it's going to be a short one minute, maybe five minute podcast. And, uh, it'll be easy for people to consume because it's only gonna be a couple minutes. So I have five minutes to distill everything down into. Yeah, it's really, I just want you to encapsulate the entire MOC process for the last 20 years, <laughs> the history of the ABMS, uh, their skulldudgery and you've got three minutes. Okay. Go, I'll get the category. <laughs>